Hello again. This video is a follow-up to the one that I made last week on raising multilingual children. It'll be a question and answer session. I'd like to get this format set up if I'm going to be getting back into the habit of making videos again, especially uh, upon demand for various topics. Uh, upon reflection, I think one reason I fell out of the habit of making videos is it's just not very fun or gratifying to just sit and, and talk to a camera, particularly if you're used to lecturing to a class or an audience where people can ask questions, uh, that interaction is very important. So I'd like to have that to a certain degree, so by answering questions that people pose to the videos that I make. So let's get started. Uh, first of all, a guy named Dave Hayter uh, posed several questions. Um, I think that you misunderstood what you, you asked if I, uh, you said that my sons weren't interested in German, so I didn't push it at them. Um, I did not say that. I listened again. While I was talking about German, what I said is that uh, I think that they need more time for their German, for their Latin, for their languages in general, but we have an hour designated for it, and they're not really able or willing to, to budget more time for that, so we have to limit ourselves to, to the time. <clears throat> of about half an hour of German when we do it. I would say that German is one of their favorite languages, uh, maybe not as such, but because it's one of their more advanced reading languages, uh, we have the most fun with it, reading interesting things. So you also asked if I had any uh, proposed new languages for them, or sort of a, a conscious introduction to polyglottery that I was trying to give them. Um, not really. Uh, as I said, we're limited in, in the time that we can do languages, but the way we added Spanish and Russian was when they were interested in them. So so uh, if they get interested in other languages, then certainly uh, we can budget more time. I think I'd like to do that. One thing I can think maybe I'd be able to interest them in is um, Greek because uh, they have the mindset already that it's better to read something in the original than in a translation. And the New Testament is very important to them, so they ought to learn how to read New Testament Greek. I think that kind of segues into a question that Bruce Tepke asked about the importance of, of Greek to me, Greek and Latin. And well, Latin I covered last time, of course, is uh, they're both critical languages in terms of the etymology and cultural heritage, things to read in them. So uh, I would hope that if they got started by reading Koine Greek, then they would like to go back and learn and develop um, ancient Greek. Modern Greek is interesting. Um, I understand there's a movement to finally get ancient Greek spoken again. That would be interesting to get them involved in as well, but that would have to come from their, their own interest. I really don't want to push them or force them into doing things. Um, Dave, you also asked one final question, if they were drawn to any particular fields and how languages would benefit them. Um, I don't I'm not teaching them languages to benefit them. I'm teaching them languages because I'm a polyglot and it's what I do. I love them. I love my sons, so it's something I share with them. Uh, Ardashir is, uh, the older one is a little bit more, I think, in, inclined to do something maybe uh, with languages in terms of writing or, or doing something. Uh, Valdemar, the younger one, uh, wants to go to Mars. We went to the astronomy uh, uh, a planetarium a couple of years back and he learned that there's a Mars expedition planned for 2030. So uh, he's got his heart set on, on being part of that, so maybe he'll be able to be an interpreter for Martians if we meet any there. <laughs> um. Ryan Booth, you asked a number of questions. Um, I'm talking about resistance on the part of kids to languages. And yes, I know that this is a very real phenomenon. In fact, yesterday I was talking to one of the uh, IT guys at my university as he was installing something on my computer. And he's uh, Pakistani, he's married to a Filipino lady, and they have a four-year-old son. And since the two of them communicate in English, he was saying that his son just will not respond. If he tries to speak Urdu to his son, or I think he said his wife speaks um, bis Bisyala. If he tries to speak, she tries to speak Bisyala to her son. Uh, he just looks at them with big eyes. He will not talk back to them. He will not interact with it. So um, I'm losing my paper that I have my questions here in front of me. Okay, just a second there. Um, so uh, I also have seen that, I've known that in the background of my life. I've had friends who have told me that they are, you know, they could have been bilingual. Their parents spoke a language to them, but they always spoke back in English. English is very dominant in the world, and I don't know why children are that way, but now that I'm thinking about it, I can recall that when my sons were taking uh, courses for those Francophone kids at the French Cultural Center, um, they would complain, I would complain, the teachers would complain that many of the other children uh, would immediately switch to English as soon as the, the, the teacher was not around. And that's, they were doing this in the French Cultural Center to speak French, and they usually had one French parent, and I remember meeting some of the parents, and 
both teachers and parents asking me, you know, how, how come my kids are happy to speak French? Don't, they don't switch to English, whereas theirs do, and I, I didn't have an answer for them. So, uh, I can I just think it comes back to the love that I feel for the language and for them, and just merging the two of those together. So yes, you asked if I speak French to them in public when uh, when my wife is not around. I, yes, that's, that's our default language. I, we always speak French. Um, when other people are not around, when we're not in a group, it's, it's rude to do that if others are, so then we'll speak English. But when we're alone, French is our language, whether we're in public or uh, in, in private. Um, and you also asked if, uh, if I thought maybe their international life had uh, rid them of the desire to blend in in terms of other children sometimes maybe not wanting to speak foreign languages because it makes them stand out. I, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, probably, yes. I mean, they have lived in four or five different countries, been around with different people, so uh, I don't think that they feel any particular desire to, to blend in, no. <laughs> okay. So, um, somebody just with the initials FMC asked a question about language mixing. Uh, it's noticing that I don't mix my languages uh, when I'm speaking to them. Uh, when we're doing German, we, we try to stay in German. Uh, uh, whether this was uh, intentional or by, uh, by chance just worked out that way, I think it's more um, that I think about it. It's not something that I would do. Uh, it's something that doesn't seem to make any sense to me because I'm not teaching them the way I'm teaching a class. You said that you go around with your three-year-old and um, you will speak English with him, but then you'll have him say the same thing in Portuguese and in Spanish. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing, but it does seem a bit like teaching, and I think children could just pick it up uh, more naturally if you were just to speak one language with them and then another one, you know, at different times. I think that might work well. Um, you asked what I did in terms of toddler learning. I, I thought I covered that last time. I mean, I just spoke to them, and, and more than anything else, reading books, reading books in foreign languages allowed to them is uh, what I think has made them become who they are. Uh, Daniel Cook. You say that you have a baby who's going to be born in a couple of weeks. Well, congratulations. Your life is about to change dramatically uh, for the better, I hope. Uh, and uh, you want him to become a Spanish speaker. So you're thinking of hiring a Spanish speaker for a few hours a week to speak to him. You want to know if that will work? I guess that's what people have done all through history when they get uh, nannies or governesses to, to be with their children and they specifically seek au pair girls to, to speak other languages. I don't think that will hurt, but um, I keep coming back to the theme of love and love of languages. Will this person love your child? Will the child interact enough with this person to um, sort of have this become a, a living thing or will it just be you know, a couple of hours a week? Um, you ask about other methods. Uh, I do recall for somebody like you, I have them somewhere. I could probably find it. I don't remember off my hand. There is a set of CDs that was made um, that had lang many, it was designed for babies, infants, to hear all different languages. Um, so that we don't lose our phonetic window. I, I think that uh, they say that there's about 200 phonemes that are used in human languages altogether, but most languages only use about 50. So when we're young, we can hear all 200, but uh, as we grow up, we don't hear them, so we lose uh, three quarters of them. So maybe listening to these CDs will keep that sort of phonetic window open and the child will be able to, to learn later, better languages uh, better later on. Um, other methods you ask about, I would say that you have the opportunity to challenge yourself and challenge your child, improve your own Spanish and, and improve it with, with your son or daughter and, and grow with it. And that will be the, the loving of sharing a language. So um, yeah, use this occasion to, to improve your own Spanish. Finally, an American linguist uh, asked a couple of questions. Uh, you wondered if um, I was giving too much emphasis to languages and humanities, and how did I go about with uh, teaching? Uh, I'd have to look it up. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and uh, sports and exercise. Um, no, I don't think I'm doing uh, too much languages and humanities with them. Um, they have a good balance of, of classes that they're doing. Yes, that in their program they're uh, supposed to be mainly learning independently, but when they write essays, and they write lots of essays for both English and history, I'm the one that reads those and gives them feedback on them. I spend an hour a day on foreign languages with them. but. 
they actually do uh, probably spend more time on science and math. Uh, I'm not good at those, but my wife is, so uh, she corrects their uh, mathematical and, and science, and science uh, work. Um, they're just as good in these. Uh, if I can be a boasting father, uh, last semester, Artish Year, who's only 15, took the uh, AP exams in calculus and uh, in chemistry as well as in English, and he got a five in all of them, the top score. Um, so they have a fair balance of, of science and math as well in their learning. And uh, sports and exercise, well, yes, I'm their gym teacher as well. We have a great deal of fun exercising for about an hour a day every morning, too. It depends on the season. We'll go swimming, we'll play baseball. Lately, we've been lifting weights. so. Uh, uh, we do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you asked about musical talent, whether this language developed musical talent, and they did music. Um, I'm not sure if I can see a, di a direct link between language learning and music learning. I'd like for there to be. Um, but yes, they, they do play piano, both of them. They've had uh, lessons and classes for, for many years now, seven, eight years. Uh, they passed uh, several exams in them, and they play very well. I, they don't play much spontaneously because they feel like playing, uh, which I wish they would do, but they certainly know how to do it. And um, so, yes, I think there's, there's some link. And all of that, science and math and all these other things, you asked my last question about a balanced life. Um, what that means, uh, well, in my own case, it means not being monomaniacally obsessed with learning languages like I was for a good portion of my life and trying to do some creative writing and develop other talents, play my flute, uh, just spend more time with my sons, helping them grow, all of that. And likewise for them, when I say a balanced life, uh, why I don't want to force them to spend more than an hour a day. If they would want to spend two hours a day on languages, I'd be overjoyed to do that. But um, they really do have a fair amount of schoolwork, and I would rather have that they have more time to be creative on their own and read, read spontaneously on their own than have uh, me force any kind of project upon them. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much all the questions that I specifically got to this topic. So um, I just want to say that I, I'm kind of committing myself to making a, a video a week. Uh, I'd like to do it on Saturdays. So this is when I have time to sit here and do this. Um, and I think I will be able to do that pretty much all the rest of the, at least the next two months for the rest of this semester. But uh, for the next two weeks, I won't be able to, unfortunately. Next week, I will be at the Polyglot Conference in Ljubljana. Maybe I'll meet some of you there. And then the week after that, another example of a balanced life, I'm the... Um, the faculty uh, coach of the Model United Nations Club at my university and will be participating in an event at, uh, at another university the following weekend. So I may not be able to post a video for the next uh, two weeks, but I will certainly do one on the next Saturday. Thank you.